I know you haven't played the Borderland games, but there is a bit in there where Claptrap says that he just spontaneously says the word sphincter when he's in a lot of pressure. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's my spirit animal. Apparently, yeah. Apparently, you are just human Claptrap, human? which I'm sure isn't the first time you've heard that. <laughs> Oh, that was mean. It's a Booze of Spirits podcast. I was going to start with Hey Everybody at least. Hey everybody! Hey everybody! It's a Booze hey, and podcast. Hey everybody! It's like it's I drink like with death. With death. <laughs> hey everybody! Hi Theo. Theo's here now. We can start. Okay, good. That's what I was waiting for. We do not have Mel this week. She uh, had a, a sudden emergency and could not be part of this episode, which is going to really stink for me because I did like a minimal research on mine because I figured, oh, we're gonna have three people. We'll be able to fill the gaps. So. Yeah, no, I kind of, um, samesies, so <laughs> we'll see. Maybe she'll get spliced in. Maybe. I almost said sphinctered in. I'm having a That's, really hard time that with the <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a word that, I mean, it's not the opposite, but I don't know if it's more different <laughs> in meaning from splice um, than sphincter. I mean, it kind of is, because sphincters contract. Splices mm-hmm. detract. I'm detracting. And there's all those mad scientists who are gene sphinctering uh, monsters together in horror movies. It's true. Um, I am. I don't know if it's just because I've been in large amounts of pain for, I think we're going on six weeks here, but words are really hard right now and I apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to, we're going to talk about some shit today. We are. Do you have a uh, not sponsor for this week? Oh, no, I forgot that was a thing. It's going to be Theo's toenails, though. Oh. Because they're very aggressive and he just put them in my leg. <laughs> not sponsored by Theo. Not uh, sponsored okay, by Okay, well, Theo. I guess I'm assuming Artist you have toenails. A not sponsor. I'm not sponsored by sphincters. Do you have terrible heartburn? You are not sponsored by sphincters. <laughs> Do you have pieces of film that you need to join together in a way that makes sense? Do you want to get involved in genetic in- <laughs> genetic editing? I can't speak now. Genetic editing. Try sphincters. It's the wrong word for the right situation. <laughs> Why is my dog so excited about that? Did you sphincters? You like sphincters? <laughs> Dogs of all sizes and ages love sphincters. It's sphincter. It's sphincter. <laughs> It's big, it's heavy, it's wood. I hope not. <laughs> see a specialist. <laughs> <sighs> so, um, what are we talking about today? Well, we discussed movie ghosts or haunted movies or, you know. Some, something along those lines. Kind of cool. leave it all, the, the normal pattern of extraordinarily vague interpretation. It's cool. Mine has absolutely nothing to do with an actual ghost. I don't think mine does either. I think I just You're found, like, welcome. movie trivia about, oh, people said this movie was haunted or cursed or, and that's kind of where I left it. And unfortunately, like, I mean, there's like a hundred BuzzFeed articles on that about, hey, here's 17 haunted movie sets. And the reason that they have 17 haunted movie sets is because there's not enough content in any one of those movie sets to be worth an article in its own or True story. a podcast. So this may be our world record for the shortest podcast. I mean, I make shit up. Yeah, we'll just we'll just fill the middle up with nonsense. Do you, know, may... do you know how haunted the VeggieTales movie is? <laughs> Well, it's certainly cursed. I know That's that true. much. Cool beans. Am I going first? Are you going first? Go first. All right. So, I'm going to talk about a cursed movie that somehow is not even a horror movie because, you know, most of these cursed haunted movies are of the genre. Mm-hmm. This, this is not of the genre. Okay, good. And this movie doesn't exist because of this curse. Oh, I think I read about this one. So, the curse of a took. A took. A took. I took a dump with my wooden sphincter. 
Is there an alternate reality where George Washington had a wooden sphincter that's on display in the Smithsonian? That's the one we're about to live in. That's going to be the next Mandala effect. <laughs> and they tell us it's a wooden sphincter, but it's really made from a slave sphincter. Yes. <laughs> Multiple slave sphincters. Multiple that wasn't just one sphincters. set of slave teeth. <laughs> They've sphinctered a bunch of sphincters together. And yes. To make a prosthetic. Okay. On track-ish. <laughs> we're going to 1963 Canada. Are you intrigued yet? Um, not exactly. Do I need to uh, bring a bunch of furs to trade? What are we doing here? <laughs> Don't think the fur trade was that heavy in the 1960s, but... Okay, 1963 Canada. I know you're all intrigued right now. <laughs> a man named Mordecai Rickler releases a book. The Incomparable Atuk. It's a satirical novel. That is the original title. It was published in the U.S. as Stick Your Neck Out. <laughs> but The Incomparable Atuk tells a story of a Canadian Inuit who's transplanted to Toronto and quickly adopts the greed and pretentiousness of the big city. So, first of all, if this movie had been made, I'm sure it would be incredibly offensive. But Oh yeah, there's no doubt. Like, I mean, think Nanook of the North only trying to make it funny. <laughs> they take this they take this book and they're like, this is this shit's hilarious. Let's make a movie. But let's set it in the U.S. So it's going to be, we're going to find this Eskimo. We don't really use this word. I know that. But we're talking about the 80s here when that was acceptable. We're using, so we're going to take this Eskimo. A documentary film crew is going to come to his little town in Alaska. And when they leave, he's going to hide on the plane. And he's going to make it to New York City. New York City. And it's going to be crazy. He's going to try to harpoon a bus. Essentially, that's the summarized version of what the, this movie's going to be. But the story here goes deeper, because in theory, this movie... And you know what? Logically, this bullshit should be cursed. That makes sense to me. <laughs> so a film adaptation was requested by a Canadian director named Norman Jewison. <laughs> no, he wasn't. I can't make this up. <laughs> I'm not saying no one made this up, but I can't make this up. So in the 70s, a man named Todd Carroll writes an adaptation, moving it to the United States. Jewison starts making plans. They're going to give the role of a took to John Belushi. Yeah, I, I can see that. It's 1980s. You want someone to do stupid stuff on the streets in New York. Why would you not pick John Belushi? Exactly. Like, that would, that, I mean, that would be my first choice. I'm perfectly honest. Yeah. <laughs> So he was offered the lead in 1982, but just a few months after he's offered the lead, to be fair, I did not find if he confirmed the lead or if he was still in the works of becoming the lead, but anyway. It might have interfered with his samurai time. Uh, John Belushi dies in March of 1982. Setting his brother's career on a trajectory from which the world has not yet recovered. I mean, he has good parties at his house from what I hear. I haven't been to one, but it's nearby and I think I should get to go. <laughs> Do you remember when we went to Bumber Shoot and David Cross did a whole bit about a Jim Belushi biography? <laughs> Not really, but I oh, might have been drinking like... heavily. I do remember <laughs> Mom trying to, like, unintentionally crashing into him at the airport one time when they were picking me up. <laughs> like, body to body, not like with a car. Like, he was just, like, trying to get his luggage, and Mom's just, like, being Mom. Move it, you prick. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no one likes you. Then she texts me. I'm still getting off the plane. She's like, I might have just ran over a Belushi. Okay, great. <laughs> Great, Mom. It's not the first time. It's not the weirdest thing she's done. John Belushi dies. He's 33 years old. There's drugs involved. Oh, were there? <laughs> yeah, we were just weirdest damn thing. <laughs> I think his uh, girlfriend or whatever she was got charged with first degree murder eventually, etc., etc. Wait, really? Apparently I need to look into this. I don't know nearly enough about John Belushi's death, apparently. Well, I believe a woman was the one that gave him that final dose of heroin or whatever it was. Yeah, but that's not first degree murder. That's like... It is if you're a celebrity. And he resisted. I don't know. 1982. Fuck fuck all. This isn't going to pan out. Our star is dead. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. why. 1986. Cool. They're like... <laughs> okay, fine. Just get it back on the market. Let's see what we can do. We gotta have someone snowshoe across a Rockefeller Center. Let's make this work. So at this point in time, they get Sam Kennison on board. <laughs> because when I think 
<laughs> Inuit, I think. Obviously. Sam <laughs> Nothing, no one looks more Inuit than that guy. <laughs> so, uh. To be fair, at that time, Sam Kinison was about the biggest thing in comedy, so I guess there is the star. Filming power starts character. in 1988. He makes it through eight days of filming, and then he's like, fuck this! Fuck it, guys. This isn't okay. That's my that's Sam my Sam Kennison <laughs> impression. Do you like that? Um, yeah. So I guess he didn't <laughs> like the way the script was turning out and the movie was being filmed, and he had been given creative override on things because yeah. he was Sam Kennison. Fuck yeah. You'd be stupid. Then he uh, starts fighting with the studio, and then there was a lawsuit, and the movie is put on hold until 1992. And they start to set up production again. And then on April 10th, 1992, Sam Kennison dies. Sam Kennison did not dra- die of a drug overdose, which, you know, would make sense, I feel like. But uh, he was uh, driving a pickup with his wife, I believe. Might have been a fiance. I think it was a wife. He's driving a pickup and a 17-year-old that is drunk crosses traffic and hits him head on. His best friend was in the car behind him, Carl LeBove. And pulls over and couldn't see any visible energies. And energies? Words are hard. He doesn't see (laughs) any injuries. But he can tell, like, he is injured, but he can't see, like, the physical evidence. His wife appears to have a concussion. But Sam starts talking to himself. He just starts repeating, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And then the witnesses say, it appears he is talking to someone that no one else can see. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. But why? Okay. Okay. Then the man loses consciousness. And he's dead. From what I've heard of Sam Kennison, I can a thousand percent believe that story. So, um, his wife survives. Also, I I am curious if his corpse was defiled by, um, homosexual necrophiliacs, as that was one of his bits. Okay. It's, I am not sure. There goes star number two. All right. Mm -hmm. They're not giving up. Fuck this. We're making this movie. It's 1994. Guess who they offer the role to, and he happily starts studying the script. Well, let's see. It's someone who died, so it's... Uh, I'm trying to remember when did John Candy die. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, nope. No. This, oh, no. This no, is around wasn't. John Candy. Okay. That wasn't what I actually thought it was, but here we So, go. <laughs> uh, John Candy starts studying the script, and then uh, he's working in Mexico and dies on March 4th at the age of 43. He had asked, reportedly asked his close friend, Michael o- Donahue, to read it and potentially take on a, a lesser role and join him on the cast. November, O'Donohue dies. So he dies at 54. He has a history of chronic migraines and dies from a cerebral hemorrhage. So is that related? Is that not? But still. They're all connected to the script at this point. About the rage of a thousand upset Inuit spirits is raging, raging through, through all sure. these chubby comedians. That's right. All right, making them take another bump. They weren't gonna, but the Inuits have eighty-seven words for snow. So. Oh, I was gonna make a snow reference there. Too, so. <laughs> um, all right, so nineteen ninety-seven. We're gonna try again. Enter Chris Farley. I would see that's who I was going to guess last time. Chris Farley is like stoked. This is a role that was like intended for Belushi, who he idolizes. And then uh, he's All reading his this. All favorite dead comedians. He's getting, he's reading the script. He's getting prepared. Bam. December 18th. He is found dead at the age of 33. Also died in the same manner as Belushi. So I guess he was like going hard. Well, it was his hero. Here's the part that you and I are going to obviously get sad about. Farley had also tried to get one of his friends involved Mm -hmm. in the production of this and joining the cast. This friend was Phil Hartman. Of course. Why wouldn't he? Five months after Farley dies, there is the Phil Hartman tragedy, which we won't even joke about because fucking Phil Hartman, where his wife killed him and then killed herself. That's not in your spirits. That's a psycho bitch. Yeah. So I believe that involved an argument where he told her he wasn't going to deal with her going doing drugs anymore. Story of that, he gets in an argument with Bryn Hartman, his wife. She comes into the bedroom at 3 a.m., shot Phil three times, drives to a friend's house, confesses to the murder. Friend doesn't believe her, so the two of them go back to the house. The friend sees the body, calls the police. As the police arrived and escorted the children out of the house, Bryn locked herself in to her bedroom and, and, took, and took herself out. 
Fuck that bitch. She shot him with kids in the house and then just left. <laughs> uh, so I took his un- unmade still. Script still exists. I think someone can go buy it and, you know, start production if they want somewhere in someone's clearinghouse. So if you donate to our um, Patreon, that'll be one of our potential projects. Oh, yeah, no. Money. We will. We will if not he, cast he... an overweight white man, though. We're going to find. Oh, I, I don't get to be in it. <laughs> oh, I mean, you can. I wasn't going to cast you as the, as it took. You'd be in it. Okay. I wasn't. I wasn't trying to get you dead. You got kids. Right. Right, well, that's fair. Bobby Lee. Bobby Lee. Let's get Bobby Lee to play. I mean, not that I'm wishing death on Bobby Lee. I'm just saying that he'd be a good choice for the role. I don't know who that is. It's a comedian, actor, Mad TV. Consult- uh, consulting. Korean, I believe. Korean American. Maybe Chinese American. I think Korean. Well, I mean, that's closer than a white guy. I mean. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's a. He is. Um, at least not white. Yeah. Uh, he's funny. And. He is Korean American. I'm sure there's an. Inuit comedian somewhere out there we could probably track down, but I don't think they're going to have the star power to uh, get that get butts in the seats. Please get it. Please get our money made from it. Yeah. You know, get yeah. our money back. Yeah, from our Patreon. Um, so <laughs> I mean, it is controversial. Is this really a curse? Is this just uh, you know people making poor life choices in their already unhealthy bodies? I'm I'm going to lean towards curse on this though. Like you you can't just piss off the ancestors and think nothing's going to happen when you're this aggressive about it. I don't know. We'll watch I took making rat skin moccasins. That might be, uh... That might make the whole family giggle. It'll play big in the sticks, as they say. Good talk. No? Yeah. So that's my story. Okay. Should I move on to mine? Unless you want me to make some shit up. Or we'll just do a super cut of all the times the word sphincter is said on Beavis on Behead just try to sphincter 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 are we bad people? <laughs> yeah we're terrible at being people <laughs> we're much better at being like aliens so alright alright well I did pick a horror movie which I mean was my intention that's where a lot of like cursed haunted stories come from is from horror movies so And I picked one of my all-time favorites. You can tell by how excited my voice is as I yawned while I said that. One of my all-time favorites, The Omen. Ooh, I'm assuming we're talking original Omen, not Julia Stiles' Omen. Does that exist? I haven't watched that. I I mean, it's not... I don't think. Maybe I not the. It's not the worst remake I've ever seen. A lot of these remakes I've watched, but I don't remember them at all. Like, I know I've watched them, but they just mean nothing, so I don't... Like, I watched the Ryan Reynolds Amityville Horror within the past three months, and I remember nothing from it except... I remember like, Ryan Reynolds he, he wandered without around, a shirt. He wandered yeah. shirtless in the rain. With an axe. That's, um, that's the best part to remember. <laughs> well, it's the other thing I really remember, so... The Omen had a series of bizarre and peculiar things attached to the making of the film. Does everyone know The Omen? Gregory Peck, Lee Rimmick. They may or may not be accidentally raising the Antichrist as their own. It was an accident. An accident that they stole their baby and swapped it out with the son of the I stole the baby! Like I said, it started Gregory Preck. Preck. All I had was like two shots of rum. This is... I've had zero alcohol. You just said unacceptable and it made me really happy. I did say unacceptable. <laughs> me fail English? That's impossible. Shortly before shooting, Gregory Peck had a near miss when he canceled his seat on a flight, just kind of out of the blue. There is no reason attached to it in any of these stories about why he canceled this flight, but the flight that he canceled his seat on ended up crashing and killing everyone on board. And this is a particularly cruel twist of fate. When the plane crashed, it hit a car on the ground that happened to be carrying some of the pilot's family members Jesus inside. Jesus Christ. <laughs> right? So, so we're already off to a good start here. <laughs> Later, Gregory Peck took a plane to England to go shoot the movie, and that plane was struck by lightning. Uh, luckily, no one was injured. The writer, David Seltzer, he took a plane to England to join the cast and crew two days later, and it was also struck by lightning. Killing it. Killing the game here, guys. Executive producer Mace Newfield, which, like, is there a better 
mid seventies name than Mace Newfield. I just love that name. Norman Jewison. Oh, okay. See now, <laughs> Mace Newfield. That's a badass name. Norman Jewison sounds like a character in a bad Saturday Night Live skit. <laughs> It might be who he is as a person. It's fine. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the executive producer, Mason Newfield, and Gregory Peck and several others had a reservation at a restaurant one evening during the filming. But they did not get to go and make that reservation because before they made it to the restaurant, it and the building were destroyed in a violent explosion. Oh, I mean, it's best it happened before you got there. And Newfield and his wife, they had another near miss. When the London hotel they were staying in suffered an explosion a few days after they checked out. So, like I said, this is mid-70s uh, Britain. Both of the explosions were attributed to the IRA, placing bombs and blowing people up as uh, they were fond of doing in those days. I've heard they did that once. I've heard some stories. <laughs> so... Do I need to go over the movie very much? There's a lot of, like, great scenes in the movie. Like, my favorite scene has always been the nanny who throws herself out the window and says, It's all for you, Damien, and hangs herself. Yeah. I believe this is kind of like in the second act of the movie where uh, Peck is running from dogs in a graveyard. Some Rottweilers. I think it's like when they went to go dig up what was supposed to be his son's grave and they just found... Or no, like the... His son's actual mother, and it ended up being, like, the corpse of a dog. I vaguely remember this, yes. It's been a while since I've watched it. So they were running away from Rottweilers, and they had a stuntman, you know, doing the running, running away from the Rottweilers. The Rottweilers attacked the stuntman and bit through his protective suit. That's impressive. Yeah, and uh, they ended up giving him some pretty heavy injuries, and they absolutely refused to acknowledge their handlers as the handlers were telling him, hey, stop. Stop. <laughs> These professionally trained dogs that have only yes. ever done this this time where they don't listen. Yeah. Um, another another big animal scene is the baboon scene. Do you remember that one? Yes. Like they go to the zoo, right? Uh, yeah. They go to like a wild animal park and where they drive through and there's a baboons area and then all the baboons go crazy and start beating on the car because, you know, it's got the Antichrist in it and they're trying to do their due diligence. Okay. Um, for that scene, the original plan was to... Or uh, not just the plan. What they did was they put a live baboon in the back seat of the car with Lee Rimmick and uh, the actor playing Damien because they thought that would antagonize the baboons on the outside and you know that would make them start attacking the Seems car. Seems safe. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Good plan. Instead of attacking the car, they all turned on the handlers instead. <laughs> so, so we have some more animals that uh, are just tired of their shit, right? The biggest incident, though, was that one of the baboon handlers died the very next day after they finished shooting that scene. Oof. He was mauled to death by a tiger. According to reports, like, the tiger just put his mouth in his head, squeezed, and it was over. Like, it was... There's some derping happening. Sorry. Yeah, there's uh, there's another incontrollable animal uh, over there I can hear. Ow! And he's hurting me with his toenails! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Hi. I thought this show was not brought to us by his toenails. Yeah, there they fucking are. Again. <laughs> Get your snoot down. Derp, derp, derp. Thank you. Okay, go on. So, oh, the final and uh, possibly most harrowing tale from the set. The day after filming wrapped, special effect director John Richardson and his assistant slash wife Liz Moore were in a serious car accident. Richardson was knocked unconscious, and Moore was decapitated by a tire. In a lot of ways, kind of mirroring the scene in the movie where the guy gets decapitated by the sheets of pain glass. Oh, it's real cheery. Yeah, and uh, Richardson claimed after the fact that just before the accident, he saw a road sign that listed the town of Omen, O-M-M-E-N, being 66.6 kilometers away. <laughs> I do think I remember hearing that fun fact. So that was what I dug up on the Omen. I don't know. Are there any other side stuff that you... Something from a movie you saw that was interesting that you just didn't think was big enough to fill I mean, story? there was a few interesting things. Um, apparently, there seems to be activity affiliated with every Conjuring movie. Or, like, Conjuring franchise movie so far. I saw they had some... The most that... haunted... 
was The Nun, which was filmed, like, in Romania in, like, a castle, so. Mm-hmm. Well. Those yeah. ghosts were probably there to start with. Yeah, um, that's, you're asking for that. Blair Witch definitely had activity. I remember the craft when they were making that, they were having issues. And they ended up bringing in some, like, actual pagans to smooth things over. Well, but, okay. And that, because Feruza Bulk was not, she did not go into the craft as an actual pagan. Oh, I thought she was. No, I think she was, like, more familiar with it, but, like, she didn't actually go down that road fully until after the movie, from what I understand. The, the one, and I don't know that this is a curse or anything, but the story that always sticks out to me is the one from the filming of the Twilight Zone, the movie, where the lead actor for one of the stories and two of the children that were part of the story were killed in a ridiculous helicopter accident. But I don't know that was so much as a, of a curse as much as the director not following safety precautions and trying to go over blowing on the uh, pyro budget. Well, and then there's, I mean, there's obviously the curse... Of Poltergeist, which I believe what was what Mel was going to talk about. It's what she was going to talk about. With all of the death and destruction on that. And, you know, what do you expect to happen when you're in a pool full of human skeletons that you were told were fake? No one said they were fake. <laughs> That's some misconception. In the 80s, if you wanted a skeleton in a movie, you ordered skeletons from India because that's how you got skeletons. No, There was no fake skeleton market that's in the true. 80s for making movies. <laughs> but they had, they had, what, four actors die in three years or something like that? Yeah. Our friend Jake, he told me one time that his grandparents lived down the street from Heather. Mm-hmm. That was a little girl, right? I think so. Uh, Heather or work and uh, when he would go visit his grandparents he would go play with her and one summer he went down there to go play with her because he hadn't heard what had happened <laughs> and that's what he, that's how he learned that she had died um, the exorcist was supposed to have a haunted set mm-hmm. this was interesting I saw that ghost Patrick Swayze yeah that whole movie oh yeah was was, was, was haunted by Heather supposedly, O'Rourke? Yeah, supposedly with by the ghost of Heather O'Rourke. I believe like they, that was going to be the basis of the main part of Mel's story. She told me specifically the ghost of Heather O'Rourke. Heather or Oh, the b b b Get back, get I know Vera Farmiga, when she was doing the Conjuring movies, was getting a lot of, like, mystery bruises and claw marks on her body. Yeah. Apparently... The inexplicable events during the possession turned Jeffrey Dean Morgan from a skeptic to a believer in the supernatural. I saw that, but I also thought that, like, everyone had debunked Dybbuk boxes by now was... I don't know. Because that's what that movie was based on. It was based on the big Dybbuk box story that was floating around in paranormal circles at the time. Well, that doesn't now, mean now, weird like, ten, shit ten was later. Well, I mean, that's fair. Now, ten years later. Also, you know... It, we're talking about paranormal and metaphysics here, where, you know, believing is half the battle. So. Yeah. Spicy psychology, we call that. <laughs> uh, three men and a baby. We said that wasn't a real ghost, right? I mean, that, I, people, I feel like the verdict's still out on that one. I do. I, yeah, I know a lot of people have made the argument that it's a, a cardboard cutout, but I also feel like I feel it's like not that was generally a, accepted. Yeah, that was like a PR cover, was from what I gathered. That doesn't make sense. Because wouldn't you want people to come see your movie? If it was the studio who's saying it, they'd say, oh, well, we really don't know ourselves. You should, I guess you should watch it and make your own opinion, well, I, is what the studio would say. I don't think they would have done that at that point in, in time, in pop culture. Plus, I don't think that they came out and said anything until it was, like, been in the theaters for a while and people were going, what the fuck is that? No, I thought I thought it wasn't even discovered until it was already on home video. Yeah, so I thought that it wasn't said to get more more theater goers. Just based on timing. It's not scary. It's not that creepy. Um, <laughs> For everyone who wants that to be like your um, text ringtone. <laughs> there you go. I believe... I don't, this, I don't know if we want to count this as a movie haunting, but Lucille Ball had an office built on the studio lot. Which studio was she with? Desilu? Well, it was on one of the bigger lots. Like Time Warner or something. She had an office built that was a replica of her house with a park across the street. So she could stage 
publicity photos with her children when she was working nonstop and not actually spending time with her children. <laughs> and I believe that is supposed to be haunted by her ghost. I saw lots of ghosts in Ghostbusters. There was a green one who ate hot dogs. Yeah. Is that not what we're talking about? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you come up with a haunty movie drink? Yes, it is called a derp and soda. And a derp puts his face in your drink, and then you cover up the dog's taste with soda. Now, uh, so my thought is, I mean, I didn't really feel like any of these stories were very conducive to, like, a certain spirit or anything. So we're just Damn. we're just going October creepy here. October creepy. Woo! It's Spooky Month! Everybody dance for Spooky Month! Spooky Month! Spooky Spooky! We're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do a blood orange margarita. Coop. But I'm going to put a little activated charcoal in it make it black. Like my soul. <laughs> and in theory, you should have less of a hangover if you're drinking activated charcoal in your booze. Like, would that, you know, filter you for the whole night? Like, if you start with that one, is that like... I said less of a hangover. And, I mean, it's really going to depend on you and how much you drink after that. Because a hangover is really a response to toxins plus dehydration. Okay. So it can only help so much if you drink the entire bottle of tequila afterwards, but... How how black does this thing get? Is it, like, specks of black floating in it, or does the whole thing turn oh, black? Oh, no, it or... should it should fully turn black with very little charcoal. Cool. I have not, I have not uh, jimmied this out yet, but I think in the past I've just shaken straight activated charcoal into a drink, which you might think is gritty, but it is not, except maybe that very last, like, sip where it's all sitting at the bottom, because it's ground to such a fine powder. That's what they make schlitz out of. Pretty much. I think I'm going to put the charcoal in like an agave syrup hmm. for the sweetener. I usually use like a triple, like use triple sec in mm -hmm. margaritas because as an alcoholic that watches my figure, if I'm going to put the sugar <laughs> in my drink, there needs to be some alcohol with it, but... Copy. If you're going to take the hit, you're going to make the hit count. Exactly. But I'm thinking we'll do the agave syrup. I'll do tequila... Probably silver, um, some blood orange juice, a little lime, maybe a little regular orange if needed. Oh. Kind of will depend on the flavor of, I should be able to get fresh blood oranges right now, but if not, there's concentrates out there. Um, and garnish it with a prosthetic sphincter on the rim. Well, I mean, I was going to do a like a control float on it maybe, but I guess. Oh, that's probably better. That's probably a better plan. Uh, I have not figured out how to actually garnish it yet, though. So um, okay. I'll see. I wasn't actually going to you know, I, force you. I will, um, I'll Google. Garnishment. Google the uh, prosthetic sphincters. I'm sure that won't get me on a weird list. <laughs> I'm sure that won't make you want to bleach your brain. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, that's, um, I don't, I, right. I don't know if we want to call it though. That's all for you, Damien. Prosthetic sphincter. Prosthetic sphincter. Baboon in the back seat. <laughs> uh... Angry monkey jam. Angry Monkey Jam. I don't want to see it. Call it a a, a black a took. I don't want to see a drunk monkey. That sounds very dangerous, especially a baboon. The, that funky monkey, drunk monkey. That's a brass monkey. Wow. That's that already exists. Okay. I don't know why Do people I'm... drink them. Eskimo Garita. <laughs> It's wrong, but it's funny. It is wrong. I don't know that, that shouldn't be. I don't know that's a pro I don't know that it goes with that drink. That but. should. I mean, an Eskimo garita. I feel like would be white. Probably a little whale blubber. I was. I would say maybe a little touch fishy. Oh, milky fishy tequila. <laughs> yes, that's Ooh. a winner. <laughs> Drank out of a hollowed out walrus tusk, Ooh. like a wine horn. I mean, we have a lot of drinking horns here, but they're horn, not tusk. Yeah. Well, kind of a shame there's not a lot of fanfare in this episode. This is episode 25. This is Woo! Quarter Century Club. And our next episode is essentially our one year anniversary. What? What's your one year? Is that the paper anniversary? Yeah. So send us your paper. Get that paper, son. Preferably not just like your local newspaper unless there's something batshit crazy in it. So yeah, our next episode is going to be the one year anniversary. It's also going to be the last episode for Halloween. So what do you want to do for that? Mm, raindrops on roses and whiskers on kitten. I don't know. Have Didn't I come up with movie ghosts? I thought was that was my contribution for the 
year. Did you come up with that? I thought I came up with it. I don't know. Someone came up with it. Might have been Theo. I thought maybe, since it's the one year anniversary episode, we could do a subject that I really try to skirt around and do paranormal threats. Possibly how to handle them. I don't know if that appeals to you or not. That might be a little out of Mel's wheelhouse. She'll come up with something she saw in Supernatural. (laughs) That's any story we give her. (laughs) But she tries, and that's the important part. She does try. she's enthusiastic. She is. More so than us. More so than us put together. (laughs) Which, you know, that's so hard. So, so hard. Yeah. Um... Yeah, we can we can discuss that more, I guess. Unless you got something. I, I'm, uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll come up with something else. Do, do I need? You'll, you'll tune in for the episode, and it'll be. Completely do I need different. to prepare you videos on how to ward your house? Like what? What is this going to entail? We'll figure that out. Oh, I don't know. Our patreons might 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 get that. All two of you. Shh! I'm going to pretend there's two. It's Tani. I'll ward her house for free. Uh, she, yeah, she's still a supporter on Patreon. I don't know why. God bless. She crazy. I guess so. Uh, we have some new merch. But, well, yeah, that's what I say. This episode is going to come out on the um, 14th, I believe. 15th, no? 14th. 15th. 15th, which means it'll be right in the middle of a T Public sale, which is where we have our merch is on our T Public store. And I think it's also like probably the last sale you're going to get if you want shit to show up at your house by Halloween. So we've got some new designs up there. We're going to try to get some more up before this airs. So check those out. There's some cool little stuff there for your spooky months. They might not be related to the podcast at all, but you know, they're there and they're cool and we like them. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're kind of, we're kind of over that shit. We're like, Hey, I want a t-shirt that looks like this. All right, let's put it up there on the store and see if anybody else wants one like that. <laughs> At least one other person wanted the shirt I wanted, so. There you go. Maybe two. Hey, and that and that design I put up, I think, is dope as fuck. I'm going to be ordering one when the sale kicks in, so. I ordered it as a tote. <laughs> we, we, it's a design that we do not own at all. I removed the MGM logo from it to make it less of a copyright issue. <laughs> What's the worst they're going to do? Send us a cease and desist? We don't have any money. Yeah. What are you gonna- <laughs> Good luck. Talk to my not sponsor. Get that blood out of my turnip. <laughs> we got a prosthetic sphincter we can offer you. That's right. Barely used. Like new condition. Ring and blood out of a turnip with a prosthetic sphincter. Are you using the prosthetic sphincter to ring it, or is it in the... Never mind. But that may be a shirt that's up by the time that uh, you hear this, so... It's true. <laughs> Ring in the new year. Press that sphincter. Uh, check out our show notes. I dare you. I doubt there's going to be fuck all there. Has it anything to do with anything? Uh, check out our website. I've been kind of doing a thing on the website where whenever we post a new episode, I kind of change out what the stories at the top of the page are. I try to put the stuff that's got the least attention on our website, so maybe check it out. Maybe you'll find something you hadn't seen before you, you think is pretty cool. Can't tell if that's a shoe or a shark or a purse. What are we even looking at here? It's the last two. It's a shark pouch. Okay. I swear to God, I'm sober. I've told you this show's goes way more off the rails when we're sober than it does when we're drunk. <laughs> Us drunk is a known factor. Us sober, fucking anything can happen. <laughs> Sorry. Um... Checks out on the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebook. Sometimes we do things mm-hmm. there. Uh, like I said, you can sponsor us through Patreon. You can sponsor us through Tee Public. Hopefully, soon we're going to be sh- doing a new uh, Bad Decisions Club. Because we made some bad decisions, and there should be getting we delivered made some bad soon. Decisions. And I think that one should be like. It's almost going to happen. It's going to have to be a video. One, so. Yeah. So we'll have that on YouTube as uh, our. Poorly neglected. I mean, it's not neglected YouTube channel. It's just there's nothing you're going to find there that's going to entice you to hang out. I'm sorry to say. I almost, I was very close to getting a ghost hunt scheduled I would have done for the Halloween episode. Like, had some friends on another podcast who would go with me, but that fell through. We're not doing that now. That's what you're missing. I mean... I have some people that would go ghost hunting with me. I just don't know where we would go. And see, and that was the thing. I was like, well, if I can get some people to go ghost hunting, and then Kate can get some people to go ghost hunting, and then I'll bet Mel could get 
or her uh, niece to go ghost hunting and like she could tag along like I bet that would we could all have like three different ghost hunts and there'd be a fuck ton of Halloween content but now that all fell through well then all fell through my fell through so I'm scrapping I just uh, booked a photo shoot in a ghost life. town does that does that count it's after Halloween yeah I don't, I don't know that. ghost towns are often frighteningly devoid of ghosts they are not sufficiently well haunted. this one the average ghost the town. one we're going to has its own episode of um Ghost douching. What is that show? <laughs> no, ghost douching. That's right. <laughs> you know the one. In fact, in fact, that sure may become a shirt too, where we just steal their logo and font and change it to ghost douching. Yeah, no. Right, <laughs> write right. it down. All sorts of shirt ideas coming at you. I mean, we're going at like ten o'clock in the morning for family photos, but it's still in the the ghost douching ghost town that is nearby. All right. Cool. Ghost douching with your host Bilbo Baggins. I don't think Bilbo Baggins would participate in that nonsense. No, but it's one of the Bagginses, those filthy Bagginses. That's probably the derp telling me we need to go pick up the baby. So I guess it's time for us to say, please drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost. Go space ghost. If you'd like to douche a ghost. Please videotape it. Send it. Send us a recording. Oh, yeah. We- <laughs> we'll watch it. I'll watch it with the curtains drawn and the lights off. It'll be home alone. Um, <laughs> bye, everybody. Ta-ta!